I'm the location scout for cell phone towers. What I discovered on top of the mountain is beyond terrifying. It's a huge paradox. Rural areas with almost no population still require cell towers to be installed on them to get dependable coverage out to the urban population centers. I was hired by a major wireless carrier to scout potential installation sites because of my interest in hiking the mountains and for my knowledge of the local area. It doesn't hurt either that I have a four-wheel drive pickup and can follow a GPS signal in the wilderness. When I first got the job, I was elated. Not many people have an opportunity to explore the woods and make some money doing it. My employer is actually an aerial antenna contractor for the cell company who installs the towers for their telecommunications infrastructure to work. They're very specific about the requirements. It doesn't have to be on the highest peak around, but ideally the best spots are locations where there's a high clearance on all sides and accessible to maintenance. It doesn't matter how great the view is if it requires going across a swamp or sheer cliffs to get to it. The installation and maintenance vehicles need a reasonably passable track to get to the site to do their jobs. That's where I come in. They give me coordinates that would benefit from new towers. Then I scout the back roads and deer paths up the ridge line and around the target area for promising locations. Most of them don't pan out. If there's a logging road near the top, it's an ideal situation, but more often than not, I end up making my own road through dense thickets and up perilous cliff sides. It's dangerous work, there's no doubt about it. As a matter of fact, more than once I've had to call a buddy of mine to drag me out of deep ravines with his tow truck, but nothing compares to what I discovered last Wednesday. Up near the top of the mountain range I was scouting, I spotted a crude lean-to hidden in a hilly recess. It was hard to recognize, and I might have mistaken it for a naturally occurring pile of brush and tree limbs, but it bore the unmistakable signs of being crafted by something. To say it was rustic would be generous, but this hastily constructed shack in the wilderness had definite signs of being lived in. Being at least three miles from the nearest passable mountain trail meant that its occupants had a strong preference for solitude. That made me approach it with a deep abundance of caution. I certainly didn't want to startle or anger some shotgun-toting hermit living off the grid. If only that was the case. I crouched behind a nearby oak to curiously spy on the cabin's unknown occupants. The hair on the back of my neck sprang out like it was electrified at the chilling vision my eyes witnessed. It wasn't hermits living there. They weren't even human. In what I could only describe as a feral clan of carnivorous forest creatures, they were living their lives, thankfully unaware of my nearby presence. If you crossed a full-grown grizzly with a large timber wolf, you might begin to appreciate the nightmare fuel species of a creature occupying this hidden mountain shack. They stood semi-erect and snarled menacingly at each other in a fierce tongue only they understood. It might have been fascinating to observe the fanged show of dominance on a nature program in the safety of my living room, but not nearly as much 40 yards away in the low scrub brush off the ridgeline. I was terrified to draw attention to myself. There was no way I could outrun those rabid-looking abominations, and my modest hunting knife wasn't going to save me either if they attacked. I feared they'd get a whiff of my scent as the cool mountain air whipped past me and blew towards them. That would spell the end of me. I was sure of that. For my crouched position, I couldn't wrap my head around how lumbering beasts could construct a human-like shelter, but they obviously had. It was definitely theirs. I would have expected them to be burrowed in a primal den or cave somewhere, but they were fully within their element inside this hidden lodge. It was fascinating watching them interact with each other. Whatever they actually were, they possessed at least rudimentary understanding of construction and tool use, which ordinary animals do not have. Having such undeniable evidence of higher intelligence, paired with seeing these gangly, unnatural creatures living so close to humanity, turned my blood to ice. They didn't get the size or intellectual development from eating berries and grass. I was pretty sure of that. They had prominent, sharpened canines, and I was intimately aware that I was made out of meat. I had to get my ass out of there as inconspicuously as possible and hightail it down the mountain pronto. This surely wasn't the world's entire population of their unknown species, all sequestered in that ridgeline shack. There had to be more of them, and I needed to warn the rest of the world before we became sitting ducks. Not being able to outrun them, I had to bide my time. It's a miracle I didn't attract notice when I came upon their lair. It's not like I was trying to sneak up on an unknown species of cabin-building ferocious wolf bears. Only because they appeared to be fighting amongst themselves had I remained unnoticed, and that could change at any moment. Assuming they had the same acute sense of smell, hearing, and sight as the apex predators they roughly resembled, I was in serious trouble. 
Being a hero was the last thing on my mind. I just hoped to wait it out and eventually escape. Nearing dusk, my heart sank, as the situation descended from dire to even worse. Most of them left the shack in different directions to do whatever wolf bears are apt to do. Yes, they shit in the woods, and why wouldn't they? Even unnatural wilderness creatures have to answer the call of nature. Yes, they poop in the woods, and why wouldn't they? Even unnatural wilderness creatures have to answer the call of nature. Now, I had them spread about in unknown locations I couldn't track visually anymore. My narrowing opportunities for escape were cut off. Beforehand, they were all together where I could see them. I wanted to kick myself for waiting too long to make my move. They were probably out hunting, and any direction I fled would mean I'd become the night's fresh kill. My mind raced. How could I avoid detection and get back to my truck? I didn't dare move a muscle, fearing even the slightest change in my uncomfortable stance would call their attention. My legs began to cramp. I desperately needed to pee, too, but I wasn't about to send out a smellogram to the vicious predators I was hiding from. Just then, my cell phone started buzzing in my pocket like a dang dinner bell. It was probably just my supervisor wondering about my progress in the woods, but it couldn't have come at a worse time. In the stillness of the quiet mountain air, it seemed like an eternity before I could find the mute switch in my pocket. I'll admit, I did tinkle myself a little bit. It seemed as loud as a car alarm under the circumstances. Unbelievably, I wasn't pounced on and devoured for my technological misfortune. It was probably one of the few good things about most of the creatures being elsewhere. They were out of range to hear it, I guess. Had the call come in before they left, I would have been dead meat, quite literally. Now I had to compose myself and figure out a real plan. How could I escape the attention of half a dozen horse-sized apex carnivores with superior senses, scattered to unknown parts of the woods? I had to devise some route which they couldn't take. While technically right, inventing such an unlikely escape seemed even more impossible than just skipping down the hillside like an unconcerned schoolgirl. Neither idea seemed possible. Then I remembered I had 200 feet of rope in my backpack. If I could get to a tree by the ridgeline and secure my rope, I could climb down one of the sheer rock faces and hopefully put some distance between myself and these unholy monsters. Did I mention I'm scared of heights? Yeah, that was going to be a serious obstacle. That's why I don't work for the tower construction team. They make big money, but they don't fear death the way you or I do. They scale those flimsy aerial antennas with no concern for their mortal lives and keep on climbing upward like lunatics. I may be able to peer off a cliff if I'm a few feet from the edge and enjoy the view, but scaling down the side of the rocky face without protective gear is a big old nope for me. At least ordinarily, but faced with being eaten by snarling wolf bears, I decided to seek the courage. I'd rather plummet to my death than be eaten. At least my broken body would still exist there at the base of the canyon and thus began my own person rescue out of certain peril. I crept away with painfully slow progress. I eyed the den mother in their shack religiously as I backed up, inch by inch. Finally, I put enough distance between her and I that I felt safe heading towards the cliff edge. I cursed myself for not packing my rope in better condition. It was wadded up and had several knots, which I didn't feel I had the luxury of time to smooth out. But I also didn't want to be twenty feet from a safety ledge with them possibly nearby. I made the time, all while I was terrified of one of the alpha males spotting me by the clearing and dragging my kicking carcass back to their lair. I picked the most secure tree I could find and cast the rope down the side. I disappeared over the edge in the realm of nightmarish acrophobia. I'd never been repelling, nor did I have the proper equipment or training, but extreme circumstances push a person to do exceptional things to save their lives. I'd watched footage of others and remembered a technique of looping the rope under the thighs and gradually easing the other side through the hand. It was far harder than it looked on television, but with the exception of a few rope burns and uncontrolled slips, I managed to make it work. No matter what, this was definitely a path which none of them had taken. I tried not to look down, but I had no other way of knowing if I'd reached the end of the rope and still suspended a thousand feet above terra firma. I proudly suppressed another urge to scream. Luckily, there was a cliff ledge about two-thirds of the length of the rope, and I felt some sense of relief. From there, I scaled a series of narrow footholds until I could make it back to the interior of the forest. As darkness approached, I didn't want to be caught halfway down the mountain, so I picked up my pace, even with the risk of attracting their attention. Hopefully, they'd already found another meal and were back home consuming it. I didn't rest until my key was in the ignition. I locked the doors and tore out of there. Frankly, I didn't breathe normally again until I'd bolted my front door more than 20 miles away. My supervisor called again in a huff. 
He was upset I hadn't answered before and was anxious for my report of the suitability of the mountain site for potential antenna construction. There was no way I was going to tell him the truth. He'd never believe me, and frankly, who would without seeing those things for themselves? Instead, he would fire me and send someone else there to get a second opinion. I wouldn't want their blood on my hands. I did my best to explain why it was definitely a no-go for a tower under any circumstances. I used the absolute best excuses I had. Let's hope he takes my word for it. All we need is for these abdominal things to get a taste of human flesh and then settle down here to hunt in the valley. It would be a bloodbath. The best thing for all involved is for them to remain isolated up there in the wilderness, far, far away from mankind. Remember that the next time you complain about having only two bars. We don't need better cell reception that badly. This isn't a typical scary story, but just a really odd situation that happened to me back about 1997. It was the late 90s and early 2000s. I worked doing trauma scene work. I was a supervisor of a crew that you never really see or hear about, but what we did was go into homes, buildings, other structures after a homicide, a suicide, accidental death, and situations like that. Sometimes they were very gruesome, and sometimes it was as simple as removing a chair and cutting out the carpet. Oftentimes it involved a lot of cleaning and removal to sanitize the scene, both visually and biologically. Our goal was to leave the scene as void as possible, like if you didn't know what had happened, you would just assume that it was all under renovation. This one time, it was about midday, so not the usual middle of the night come clean up after a dead body call. I don't know why the police and fire departments always waited till night to call us, but I would say 80% of the time that's how it happened. This day was a bright and sunny, not so warm day in a suburb of Los Angeles. I won't give the exact details of the location for privacy, or that I even remember exactly which street it was on, but I do know it was an older yet very wealthy of Los Angeles. The kind of neighborhood where you'd expect doctors, business executives, or people in the entertainment industry to live in. As we pulled up to this home, it was a huge spread of mid-century modern with fancy landscaping and a long curved driveway. The place looked very well kept and probably a showcase of the neighborhood back in the 50s and 60s. The typical scenario was I, being the supervisor, would approach the door while my crews waited by the trucks. Since this was supposed to be a small job, we only had my vehicle and our service truck. I remember seeing an old fancy Mercedes and what looked like an old Porsche in the driveway. No other cars, but maybe there were some in the garage that I didn't see. As I walk up the door, an older woman answered my knock. She was probably in her mid-fifties, very well made up with lots of jewelry on, and she was wearing something that reminded me of Mrs. Roper from Three's Company. Not cheap looking, just not that 1990s style. I explained we were here for the cleanup work. I then noticed she had a drink in her hand like a martini or something. Like I said, this was the middle of the day and probably before lunch. Not unusual to find people drinking in a time like this. She leads me into this house. It's surprisingly dark and hazy with cigarette smoke inside. Now what happens next was really odd. The entire place looked like it was a time capsule from what we would now call the Mad Men era. The house wasn't what gave me the creeps, but as she was leading me to like a second den area, we passed through the front room, another living room, and a bar, pool table area. Like I said, this house was huge, but there were a ton of people in the house, and, well, to describe them, they all looked like characters from some early 1960s movie. A guy with a sport coat, glasses, boat captain's hat, a guy in a tuxedo, a lady wearing fur collar, long evening dress. Other people there looked like some weird collage of mixed people from some dinner party set back in some Rosemary's Baby movie set. The amount of people all through the house didn't add up. There were only two small cars in the driveway, and one could only fit two people. Now what happens next was really odd. There was a low mumble of different conversations from all around, with only an occasional glance at me as we were walking over to the scene. I remember one of those huge old cabinets with a record player playing Johnny Mathis. I know that because the, it's not for me to say, playing on the radio like I was about to walk in the twilight zone. We finally get to the room where the suicide happened. There was a red velvet chair that the deceased was in, and it wasn't a gunshot, but I assume it was a razor to the wrists. The lady's standing at the entry to the room, and I'm looking over the scene. I tell her we'll remove the carpet and remove and dispose of the chairs that held most of the blood. She just nodded and still had her drink in her hand. I asked her if she could sign our work order and the release for disposal of personal property, meaning the chair. As she signs, she says, When you and your crew are finished, just see yourselves out. I told her it probably wouldn't take us more than an hour. She turned and walked away and back to her party. 
I make the journey back to the front door, through the Johnny Mathis record playing, through the cigarette smoke, and through the low-toned party conversations. I go out to my truck and my guys and tell them that this one is creepy. There's a freaking party going on inside and everyone's all dressed up. I lead my crew back to the room and they start bagging up the chair and cutting out the old blue carpet. The black stains were where the blood dripped down through it and we ended up just cutting out half the room of carpet. An even straight cut across the room is to avoid having to move lots of big old furniture. We never found out who committed suicide, but I had assumed it was the lady's husband. As we were finishing up, I stayed behind the room to take final photos, as was our protocol, to take before and after photos. I thought about looking for the lady of the house just to let her know we were finished, even though I got the impression we were to do what we needed, then leave and not bother her again. I still just wanted to give her confirmation. So as I slowly walked again through the party areas, I noticed no one was making eye contact with me or even acknowledging my presence. You would think that if everyone at the party had known about the death, it would have been conversation, or at least interest. I walk over to the front door and turn to look back at the party stuck in a time capsule and close the massive front door behind me. Driving away, I couldn't help but think what a strange day. So bright and sunny outside. I wonder how many people knew we'd just cleaned up the remnants of someone's last moments on Earth. Imagine this. It's Saturday night, and your favorite cousin came over to spend the night. It's just the two of you free to do whatever you please. Sounds like a fun weekend, right? Unfortunately, this ideal scenario ended up in a horrifying way. It was 1998. Jaden's younger cousin Miles was staying over while their parents went out bowling. Their parents always met every Saturday night to go bowling, leaving Jaden to care for little Miles. The rain was pouring, so their parents were going to be late. But it's nothing that Jaden can't handle. Two cousins have always enjoyed a fun and upbeat relationship as would any kid of their age. He's been doing this for quite a while now and knows how to entertain and keep Miles busy. Another Saturday night for the two. Miles was already worn out. He could barely string words together as his eyes started to close. Jaden's exhausted as well, aimlessly browsing through the channels to see if there's anything entertaining to watch. His eyes kept darting at the clock. It was already a quarter past midnight and their parents were still nowhere to be found. Jaden went to the kitchen to try and find some late night snack. He switched on the radio as he made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. An urgent and disturbing news pierced his ears. A family of four was slain following a break-in two hours ago at Mulberry Street. A couple, along with their two children, were found murdered in their bedroom. Authorities have yet to capture the culprit. This marks the first incident of murder following numerous reports of break-ins that have plagued the town of Fairfield. The sheriff's office has launched an official investigation regarding the murder and its connection to the recent string of break-ins. Authorities are advising residents to remain indoors and lock them. Stay safe out there, folks. Mulberry Street was where one of Jaden's classmates lived. They lived near Jaden Street. Jaden remained calm. He locked the back door and propped a chair up against it. He walked out of the kitchen and saw a figure of a man watching behind the window. Jaden froze right where he stood. The man was peering inside the house and watching young Miles as he slept. His attention then turned to Jaden and he stared the boy down before disappearing into the darkness. Jaden rushed to the front door, locked it, and secured it in place with a sturdy cabinet. Miles awakened to the sound of moving furniture and asked Jaden, What's wrong? Jaden's heart was racing. He was stuttering his words, urging his cousin to come with him upstairs. He bribed Miles with his Nintendo. He locked the door to the room and grabbed the guitar stand. Jaden shaking, telling himself that their parents will be home soon. While Miles occupied himself with the video games, Jaden's heart raced. He braced himself for what might come. The night was still and silent, nothing but the whimsical tunes emanating from the Nintendo while the rain poured outside. The stillness was broken when Jaden heard a sharp crash like glass breaking. The noise was subtle and originated from downstairs. The crash was followed by the creaking sound of wood and then the faint sound of cracking glass. The man was inside the house. Jaden stood by the door, grabbing the guitar stand like a blunt weapon. The boy's hands were trembling but ready to swing. He couldn't feel anything but the intense throbbing of his heart and the chilling atmosphere of the night. He heard faint footsteps, slowly getting more pronounced. Someone was closing in on them. He heard doors getting opened, cabinets opening and closing, then the footsteps grew louder, ascending the stairs. Jaden's mind went blank. He asked Miles to hide in the closet. Miles asked, what's going on? He was scared. Jaden put on a brave face for the little one. He told him that they're going to play a prank and he needs Miles to remain quiet in the closet until he says otherwise. His voice cracked. He told Miles that everything's going to be all right, as if he was bidding his cousin goodbye. Miles dug into the closet and put his hand over his mouth. He grabbed Jaden's hand and asked him to stay with him. Jaden pulled his hand and reassured little Miles. They're both terrified. A door slammed shut outside the room, followed by another. 
and then another. The footsteps crack, creak. It's loud and imposing. Jaden silently moved the bed against the door, but just then the doorknob turned. Jaden hid behind the bed, gripping the guitar stand with all his might. The doorknob turned frantically, followed by a series of banging on the door. Each strike resonated throughout the house, growing stronger after each bang. The door wouldn't hold. Jaden braced himself and looked at his closet. He put on a smile for his little cousin. A familiar sound stopped the banging, the sound of a car pulling up the driveway. The intruder departed and headed downstairs. Jaden pulled his bed cautiously as he opened the door, looking for any sign of the visitor. It seemed as though the coast was clear. Jaden told Miles to remain in the closet as Jaden made his way through the hallway, eager to greet his parents. He arrived at the edge of the stairs and sees a ghastly sight. The intruder stood at the edge of the stairs. A tall and slender man wearing a rundown hospital gown. His hands covered in fresh blood and muck from the rain. His bloodshot eyes were swollen, looking directly into Jaden's. Jaden heard his father's voice asking him to remove the cabinet from the entrance. The intruder departed. Jaden regained his composure and slowly made his way downstairs. He opened the door and told his parents what had transpired. His father immediately pulled the boy to his mother and went straight for the kitchen. But this time, by this time, the intruder was gone, leaving behind a mess of broken glass, blood, and mud trailing across the floor, leaving young Jaden a terrible scar that will haunt him for eternity. <laughs> Moving to a new place can be a great way to start over. New places, new faces, and new opportunities. Sometimes our new homes pose new and terrifying problems for new residents, a dilemma that Courtney would soon face with her new apartment. Courtney has always dreamed of living independently in a big city, where she could put down roots and carve a place for herself and her two cats, Phyllis and Philippa. So when opportunity came, Courtney grabbed it and set out into the world. Her new apartment was bigger and better than her last place. It was spacious enough for the three of them and close enough to her office. The only bad thing worth mentioning was a whiff of a foul odor that came and went. The landlord blamed a rat infestation in a nearby building, but assured Courtney that no such thing would reach them. It was perfect, or so she thought. The signs began to show after her first week. Lights turning on in the bathroom. The sink would turn on in the middle of the night. Courtney dismissed it all, a product of her hazy memory, blaming the stress from work as the culprit for her lapsing memory. These occurrences became more frequent and random as the days passed by. More and more troubling signs began to manifest. Things going out of place, plates and glasses falling out of their table, cabinets swinging open, and chairs and tables moving from one place to another. In some instances, Courtney will hear scratching sounds coming from within the walls. Sometimes she'd see something in the corner of her eyes that passed her. Even her cats were experiencing duress. The usually playful and lively Phyllis is becoming more reclusive, always clinging onto Courtney and hiding under the table. While the friendly and aloof Philippa is becoming more and more agitated at seemingly nothing, chasing after something that isn't there. Every night is a nightmare for the two, Phyllis running scared to Courtney and Philippa seemingly on edge from someone or something. Someone has made themselves at home. Courtney's mind raced at the thought of an unseen presence looming over her and her cats. She could barely sleep anymore from all the commotion. She began to secure her glassware, lock her doors, shut tight the cupboards, but nothing. The unexplained phenomena continued. She decided to report her experience with the landlord, only to leave her landlord dumbstruck and concerned over her well-being. She was at her wit's end. The exhaustion and fear of her unwelcome visitor forced her to divulge her experience to her friends. Despite her closeness to them, Courtney still hesitated to reveal her story in fear of being mocked by her own friends. Luckily for her, as her friends are more than happy to hear her out, she spilled the beans. Her friends came over to spend the night with her and keep guard. Courtney and her friends understandably on edge, cautious of every noise and movement. Hours passed by with no incident occurring. Courtney's reassured by her friends that they'll remain by her side as they sleep. Hours passed as Courtney and her two friends slept peacefully, but that peace was shattered when the sound of broken glass emanated from the kitchen. The three awoke from their slumber, dazed, confused, and terrified. They ran to the kitchen and arrived to see a mess left behind. Plates and glass shattered across the floor, the sink left open with water pouring on the floor and the cabinets open with claw marks. Phyllis and Philippa were nowhere to be found. Courtney called out their names to no avail. A ruckus started inside one of the cabinets with distinct meows of a cat from inside. Suddenly the cab doors burst open revealing Phyllis in a violent entanglement with a large rat. The two were fighting across the floor and exchanging scratches. Courtney picked up a broom and managed to separate her wounded feline from the feral rodent. 
The size and demeanor of the rat stunned Courtney and her friends. It certainly explains the shattered ceramic wear and unexpected aggression of her cats. The rat retreated back inside the cupboard, revealing a large hole in the wall. It squirmed its way inside and disappeared into the darkness. But their torment was far from over as the rat skittered inside the hole. The walls began to creak and crack, creating a long and overreaching crack that reached the ceiling. Something was coming. Phyllis hissed as the ceiling walls began to crack and sunk lower. The cracks grew and spewed out rat after rat. The ceiling caved in and collapsed, revealing a whole swarm of rats that had been living within the walls. Philippa emerged from the swarm as the rats dispersed, revealing a terrifying sight. A completely consumed, mummified corpse had been staying in the ceiling this whole time, providing the rats a meal to consume for months. A hapless and unidentified victim of the swarm. (coughs) Being a kid left alone in your own house can be a fun and liberating experience. You're in charge, no one can tell you what to do. But for some, it can be a bit disturbing. It begs the question, how safe are you in your own home? Stick around, we'll tell you how a situation that's supposed to be fun and exciting turned into something spine-chilling for young Harold. It was Harold's last day of school. The summer was dawning on the horizon, and young Harold could not wait for it to come. He had been planning this day for weeks. Dad won't be home until 8. His mom and older sister went shopping to prepare for her 18th birthday. His oldest brother Chad went on a road trip with his friends, and he won't be back until next week. The house was empty, and Harold was the only one home for the time being. He could barely contain his excitement, so he left his bike on the front porch, stormed immediately into the living room, opening the TV and booting up Chad's Xbox. He went to the kitchen to prepare himself a sandwich with a liter of Coke to quench his thirst. This was Harold's day, and nothing was going to ruin it. He played for hours, his eyes glued to the screen and his attention fixated on playing Fortnite. Hours passed by, and the sunny sky had already been replaced by the night's darkness. His stomach rumbled. He got up from his seat and headed towards the kitchen to make dinner. As Harold microwaved the leftovers from last night, the bushes outside the kitchen rustled. Harold didn't mind this, of course, probably a raccoon scrounging for food. Something caught Harold's eye. Behind the bushes emerged a shadowy figure. The darkness obscured the figure's appearance. Harold is left speechless and unable to move as the shadowy figure moved closer to the window. Harold snapped back to consciousness when the phone rang. It was his mother. They decided to meet up with their father before going home, she told him. They're going to be a little bit late. Harold asked his mother if she could hurry up, to which his mother replied that she'll do her best before hanging up. Harold looked toward the window again. The shadowy figure vanished. He reluctantly made his way back to the living room with his eye turned toward the kitchen window the whole time. He continued playing, trying to get his attention away from the shadowy figure he saw. Harold's concentration broke as a sudden and loud creak came from the front door. The door was open. Harold swore that he'd locked it before. He approached the door and peeked outside, hoping to see one of his friends. Nobody was there. He closed the door and locked it and stood there for a few seconds, looking through the peephole to see if anyone showed up. Harold jumped when he heard a loud crash. It came from down the hallway. He slowly made his way down the hallway, and he heard footsteps and metal clanging from the end where the basement door was found. He peeked through the corner at the edge of the hallway. The noises kept going, growing louder with each passing second until they abruptly stopped. Footsteps began to emanate from the basement door getting louder as they got near to the door before pausing for a few seconds. Three knocks followed, then another, and another, growing louder with each force after the knocks. The doorknob turned and the basement door slowly creaked open. Light couldn't reach the other side of the door. Words came from the darkness and uttered a faint whisper. Harold? The boy immediately ran up the stairs, banging into Chad's room and locking the door. He grabbed one of Chad's baseball bats and hid in his closet. Minutes passed by in silence, not a peep or a word can be heard. Harold began hearing footsteps again, approaching Chad's room and twisting the doorknob. Harold gripped the baseball bat with his dear life, ready to swing and take on whatever was on the other side. The door was unlocked and swung open. The lights to Chad's room were switched off, and the only illumination came from the hallway. There it was, a shadowy figure standing directly in Chad's doorway. Harold came out of the closet and swung the bat like a maniac until he heard a familiar voice. Harold, calm down, it's me, put the bat down. The light switched on, revealing the shadowy figure to be Chad, who had arrived earlier than anticipated. He made fun of his brother for how scared he was, to which Harold countered and blamed Chad for playing a prank on him. What prank? I just got here. By the way, you locked the front door, so I had to get in through the window, genius. That can't be right. Harold wasn't certain that it was Chad the whole time. Suddenly, the power went out. Their house was covered in pitch-black darkness. The stairs began to creak. 
Someone approached. From the dark came whispers and they caught out one name. Harold? <coughs> when I was in high school, two of my friends and I hung out almost every Friday and Saturday. I was the oldest one of the three and the only one of us that had a driver's license at the time. I drove this ancient car that sputtered and hesitated, but for a couple of high school kids that just wanted to get out of our neighborhood, it worked great. One thing we were looking forward to at the end of the school year was taking a long trip in the car, since during the school year, our parents never let us be out later than 8 p.m., even on the weekends. I'd only been driving for six months, and they were worried we'd get into some kind of situation and not be able to get home. I think that's why they let me drive that ancient Subaru, because it really wouldn't go very far. One afternoon after our last day at school, we were hyped to take a long drive to the countryside. We lived in central Pennsylvania, which isn't exactly the hub of exciting destinations for kids. But we did live close enough to Gettysburg to make it a day trip. Our parents all agreed it was a good way for us to enjoy a summer drive and not get into any trouble along the way. Now, if you're not familiar with Gettysburg, it's the site of one of the most famous battles of the Civil War. Nearly 51,000 soldiers, many teenagers like us, died during the three-day battle. So many men and boys died that graves were quickly dug to dispose of the bodies so they wouldn't be taken by animals. In fact, so many died that their bodies were found for the next 100 years. My dad told me that when he was in high school, a family that was visiting the site found the remains of a dead soldier. Surely there isn't anything that three teenagers headed to Gettysburg could get into trouble with, was there? As we arrived at the park, it was getting late in the afternoon, so we decided to just do the driving tour before heading home. We'd come back another time when we had more daylight. We pulled into the cemetery parking lot and got out to explore just as the sun was setting. People were all around, mostly headed back to their cars since the park was closing soon. As we got back to the car, it was dark out, and we were tired and ready to go home. Just then, something appeared out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look, but nothing was there. My friend Jordan thought that he saw it too, but neither of us was sure what it could have been. What's that? Jordan exclaimed. What we saw sent shivers down our spine. There, on one of the grave markers, was a whitish figure that looked like he was wearing a uniform. I quickly pulled out my cell phone to try and get a photo, but just then the battery died. As I was fidgeting with my phone, I heard the doors to the car open and close. Jordan and Betsy were already in the car, scared to death, shouting, Let's go! Let's go! I looked again at the grave marker and the figure was gone, but my heart was pounding. I hopped in the driver's seat and tried to start the car. The whir of the engine was followed by a click of the starter, and then nothing. My phone was dead, so I couldn't call my parents, and my hands were shaking too much to dial anyway. Thankfully, a park ranger pulled up in the lot just behind us and told us we had to head home because the park was closed. When I told him what happened, he just smiled and said, Oh, you met Confederate Sam. Who's that, we asked. Lots of Confederate soldiers were killed and buried here that never made it home. You must have met one of them. It's time for you guys to go home. Concerned about my car not starting, I got in and tried again, and it started right up. As we drove out of the park, my phone came to life again, and I saw I had missed a call from someone named Sam. We were camping in a small remote lake in New Mexico. Suddenly, our group heard the unmistakable cries of a young girl in need of help. There were about eight of us together in our camping spot, and another group of three about 50 feet away. We immediately looked to their campsite since we had no children with us. My husband and his sister walked to the other site and asked them if they also heard the noise. Indeed, they had. They didn't have any children with them either. There seemed to be no doubt that we were hearing a real voice in the darkness. However, this seemed unlikely to me. I was certain that it was a fox, coyote, maybe an injured deer, or even some type of a bird. Determined to find the source of the cries, we all headed towards the field behind our campsite. I thought we'd make so much noise as such a large group of people crawling through the brush that we'd scare it away if it were a real animal. But as we crept through the darkness towards the source of the noise, something caught our attention. A tall white figure standing out against the night sky. The horrifying creature looming in the distance was ghostly, tall, and impossibly white, radiating an otherworldly aura that sent shivers down our spines. We all felt an immediate sense of fear and unease as we realized that this thing was no ordinary human being. Shrouded in mystery with its ghostly pale skin and terrifying presence, it seemed to penetrate us to our core. All of us had goosebumps and were speechless at the sight. Despite our fear, though, we could not turn away from this terrifying creature. Held captive by a strange horror story unfolding before our eyes, we continued towards this ghostly specter, drawn towards it by an inexplicable sense of curiosity and dread until suddenly it vanished. Then it reappeared to our left. Half the group began a hasty retreat immediately towards the campsite, while the rest of us were simply petrified as if we'd been turned to stone. 
Time seemed to stand still as the creature stood slowly and moved back to its original spot, then faded away in the night as if floating away further into the desert night. Whether it was truly a spirit from beyond or merely some trick of nature or mind, none can say. Three of the campers next to us packed up that night and drove away as quickly as they could to the nearest motel. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be hysterical if that motel was haunted too? The rest of us? We gathered our tents together as if circling the wagons and stayed up the rest of the night telling funny stories around the campsite. After having possibly witnessed a real ghost that night, no one was interested in telling any scary stories. But that night, in the field, at that campsite, something mysterious yet frightening passed through us all, leaving memories and questions that have haunted us to this day. My first job out of college was at a residential mental health facility. I worked as a night janitor, though I was studying to get into medical school. As a result, I had the opportunity to observe many different symptoms in patients. I frequently used opportunities to chat with the night nurses and resident physicians who had no choice but to do rotations there. During the daytime, there were real doctors there, psychiatrists, but they were often too busy to pay attention to me. The residents were happy to have a conversation with me, though. Maybe because I wasn't there to ask them to do any extra work, I just wanted to learn. In any case, there was one patient that still perplexes me to this day. I remember the day he arrived, as I had the not-so-pleasant job of taking his clothing to the laundry along with all the rest of the residents' linens. At first glance, this man appeared quite normal, though he had a full, bushy black beard. Otherwise, his physique seemed relatively average, and his mannerisms were calm and composed. However, when he arrived, he was covered from head to toe with dust, clad in tattered rags as if they had clearly been his only means of protection from the elements for many years. His fingernails were torn, and he had scratches all over his skin. The odor emanating from his body, I'd prefer to forget. Yet, after all these years, I can still recall the pungent, sweet smell of his room, long after he'd had his clothes replaced in the hospital patient scrubs. When the admitting nurses examined his dusty clothes, they noticed something strange, or rather, they noticed the absence of something that most people carry. He had no wallet, no money, no phone, nothing in his pockets. He wore no jewelry or rings of any kind. Wondering if he may have committed some crimes and was trying to hide from retribution, the staff called the local police who obtained fingerprints from him without any resistance. They still bore a shocking resemblance, to what appeared to be those of a known living person. Confused yet intrigued by this odd discovery, authorities called in the man's alleged family, who insisted that he'd been dead for many years. Finally, they agreed on DNA testing, hoping they could finally put an end to this saga once and for all. And although nobody expected it, detectives confirmed that his fingerprints belonged to none other than their dear departed relatives. Yet, they were still in disbelief. Had they proved that even after death, some spirits never truly rest? His name was Abel Aiken, Abel apparently grew up in the Florida Panhandle right next to Louisiana. I remember when his family came up to visit. It had taken them two full days to drive across the country. His father and brother drove together as his mother was too sick to travel. She waited at home anxiously to learn whether or not this was really her son, whom she believed had died in a tragic car accident. Apparently, the night he went missing, a neighbor noted that their car had been stolen. After a typical search, the car hadn't turned up, and neither had her son. Years later, a diving team identified the car, and it was pulled from the lake that was just half a mile from their home. Inside the car was an engraved pocket knife that Abel's grandfather had given to him on his 16th birthday. That car matched the one that had been missing from the neighbor's house, but no body was ever found, and no clues were left in the vehicle, aside from that pocket knife. The family had him declared dead after five years, though his mother never stopped thinking about him. He kept his room quite neat, so there was never anything for me to do but sweep out the corners of his room but there was something strange about him that could not be explained by the doctors or nurses. Abel Aiken would not or could not remember leaving home that night, and he had no idea how he ended up in Nebraska over 10 years later. Some speculated that he suffered from some sort of mental illness, while others believed that he had come into contact with a force that had somehow rendered him unable to speak. Sometimes I wondered if someone had cast a black magic spell on him, but I'd never find out from him personally. Abel's eyes were vacant, and he displayed no apparent attachment to anything at all. He didn't talk to any residents. He sat alone during meals. Despite his family coming to visit and hoping for a reconciliation, they insisted that this was not their son. Unfortunately, the DNA evidence was declared null and void because the swabs the police collected had not been properly labeled and stored after collection. When the family refused to believe that this man was their son, there was still no explanation as to where the DNA match would have come from. Abel's sister tearfully said goodbye, and his family left him at the facility. 
We were powerless to force them to take him home due to the shoddy handling of the collected swabs. I only know this because after they had been collected that night, I found the swabs and placed them in a drawer with a note for the morning charge nurse to call the detectives back. I suppose anyone could have handled those swabs that night. While Abel didn't show any emotion about his father and siblings leaving, he held that stuffed animal every night, rocking in his bed until he fell asleep. I never heard him cry or speak about his past with anyone. It was almost as if he was a ghost trapped in the world of the living. Despite all this, Abel managed to live a relatively normal life within the facility, working, eating, sleeping like everyone else. I still wonder what truly drove him to such extremes to have ten years of his life seemingly vanished from his memory. And though it may sound scary to say it aloud, I often found myself drawn to Abel's quiet presence and intrigued by the story of his mysterious silence. I hope to see him again. I did get into medical school, and I'm currently hoping to become a psychiatrist. For now, however, Abel remains an enigma, shrouded in a spooky fascination. Perhaps someday I'll see Abel Aiken again and learn what happened to him. I was driving across the country with my mom and sister, and I'll never forget the night our journey took a spooky turn. We had been on the road for days, and at one point we stopped at a rest stop to fill our car and use the restroom. As we approached the gas station, we noticed that there were several young people there, a group of teenagers on a road trip, as well as a small gray car parked at the pump in front of us with two young men standing still outside of it. Something felt off about the scene. It was late at night, but we felt wide awake and alert. As my mom and sister went inside to grab some snacks and use the bathroom, I opted to stay behind and fill up the tank. All of a sudden, I heard the sound of panicked voices coming from nearby. The teenager was saying that they couldn't get their gas pump working properly, and they seemed really spooked out by something. To my surprise, they quickly left the gas station in their van without hesitation. As I watched them drive off into the night, I couldn't help but feel nervous myself. Something about that place seemed downright haunted. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild. After being on the road for so long, I was glad to see my mom and sister return to the car, ready to hit the road again. Just as I finished pumping and stepped closer to the station doors to get my change, however, two men suddenly emerged from within. They appeared to be frozen in place, not moving a muscle, not even talking or looking at each other. As my sister and my mom ran up to join me outside the building, we all noticed something chilling. The two men had pitch black eyes that seemed to reflect nothing at all back at us. Intensely unsettled by this encounter, we quickly got back into our car and sped off down the highway as fast as we could. But despite our efforts, we could not find that strange abandoned gas station on any map. It seemed to have mysteriously disappeared off the face of the earth. What truly terrified me about this whole experience was that even now, many years later, whenever I close my eyes and try to remember that mysterious old gas station and its eerie inhabitants, all I see are those terrifying black eyes staring back at me. You may never know what really went on there. It was 3 a.m. The witching hour was upon the neighborhood, but 12-year-old Lila was wide awake and constantly on edge. It's been two weeks since the Anderson family moved into their new home. It wasn't long until they started hearing noises in the house. Their new home has seen better days considering it's the oldest house in the neighborhood. At first, they just dismissed it as an old, rickety floorboards. When it got louder, though, they assumed that it was a feral animal that had made itself at home. Raccoons and other wild animals were common in the neighborhood. Lila thought differently. The young girl was convinced that someone else had joined them in their new home. She made the conclusion one fateful night when she was walking down the hallway towards her room. The floorboards were creaking as usual until something else creaked above her. The young girl didn't think much of it and continued walking. Every step she takes is followed by a faint creak, growing louder and louder. Someone else was walking above her, trailing her every step and following her every move. Lila immediately ran towards her room and hid under the covers. She shut her eyes close, covered her ears, tried desperately to convince herself that this was a nightmare. Minutes passed by in deafening silence, her ears searching for the creaking, but she heard none. She lifted the covers and slowly peeked over, staring at the ceiling and begging for an answer. She got her answer. The walls beside her bed creaked, followed by another, and then another, and then another, until the creaking finally dissipated. She nudged her head and placed her ear against the wall. She wasn't sure that what she would hear, yet her inquisitive mind didn't stop her. Till finally, the wall breathed. Labored breathing emanated from the wall directly on the other side of her ear. That was two nights ago. The creaking hasn't stopped since, following young Lila around the house day and night. She tried to convince her parents of her discovery, only 
to have her pleas be dismissed as the result of her imaginative young mind. This night was different. The creaking kept getting louder, gradually increasing in frequency until stopping abruptly. The creaks weren't coming from the attic or the walls anymore. It was coming from the doorway. The door creaked open, slowly letting in the pitch-black darkness beyond it. The creaking stopped again, and it was replaced with a faint and distant whisper from the door. Lila was stricken with fear and completely paralyzed, awaiting what lies beyond the door. Slowly emerging from the dark were long and lanky fingers, slowly opening the door inward and revealing the pale and emaciated face of an elderly woman. Her eyes were wide open as if lacking any eyelids, staring directly at poor Lila with a terrifying sense of morbid curiosity for the girl. The door swung wide open, revealing its tall and slender figure that reached up to the ceiling. She revealed a spine-chilling grin that reached her ear, revealing her thin and decrepit teeth, blacked-out gums. She wore a tattered white dress with dark stains running down the collar. The woman looked and jittered as she slowly made her way towards the hapless young child, maintaining her morbid smile while walking towards her. Lila couldn't help bring herself to move. She feared for her life. The woman stood at the edge of her bed, slowly approaching her and kneeling in front of the child. The two locked eyes. Her eyes were bloodshot, her pupils dilated. She slowly lifted Lila's head with her bony, cold hands. The child stood up and kept eye contact with the ghastly woman. The creature caressed Lila's hair as if it were her own child. Her hand began to tremble, and tears began to drop from her eyes. It mourned. For what or for whom? Lila wondered. The creature continued its impassioned cry, but Lila couldn't keep eye contact anymore. This enraged the creature, immediately releasing Lila and curling its hands. The tears were replaced by blood, its sorrowful cry replaced with an ear-splitting wail that shattered windows and caused cracks in the walls. The house began to shake violently, uprooting furniture with violent intent. By the time Lila's parents arrived, it had already disappeared, leaving young Lila with a terrible scar from the shattered window. Morning came. The family had decided to resell their home following the terrifying event. Neighbors came out and comforted the Andersons, while some came to aid and some came to spread rumors. Whispers of an unspeakable crime that occurred in the house in years past, one that cost the life of a child and drove a mother to the brink of insanity. Lila was still distraught, confused at what had transpired. When asked by her parents what she saw, she only responded with four words. It was the creek. It had been years since Jessica's return to her hometown. Twenty years passed by quickly when living in a big city. Nothing much had changed since she left, as if the town was suspended in time. The storefronts remain, faces change, men and women grow old. At the heart of it all, it's still the same old town. Her flight back to the city got delayed, forcing her to stay in town until the next day. It was already getting dark. She needed a place to stay until she could take her flight in the morning. Her parents had left the town years earlier, leaving their old house in the care of Jessica's younger cousin, Jason. Her old room was the only thing she looked forward to when she headed home. It was her peace of mind and a reminder of simpler times. The walls were still covered in posters from her youth, perfectly preserved for her to return to once more. One poster stood out. It was the oldest poster she received from Cheryl, her best friend and confidant. They'd been through thick and thin together. Jessica still mourns the day she left town and bid goodbye to her dear friend. Feeling nostalgic, Jessica decided to take a walk and relive the past days. She walked past the street where Cheryl lived. She wanted to pay her long-lost friend a visit for old times' sake. However, Jessica couldn't bring herself to do so. She was afraid that Cheryl might still be upset. She jumped into her car and headed for the one place in town that she goes to clear her head. Near the edge of town was a bridge. It was the site of many of Jessica and Cheryl's shenanigans. They hung out there when either of them had had a fight with their parents. It was their place of solitude. Jessica stood on the railing, overlooking the rushing water of the river underneath. That night it was still and chilly. Her peace was broken when a sudden breeze of cold brushed up her neck like someone was behind her. Jessica stood down off the railing and looked around. She saw nothing. However, at the edge of the bridge where it met the road was a silhouette. It seemed human, standing in the middle of the road, meters away from where the light at the bridge abruptly stopped. The shape was staring right at her. Its piercing gaze froze Jessica right where she stood. The shape was approaching closer and closer to Jessica, ready to step in the light and reveal itself. Jessica? A familiar voice called to her. She turned around and saw Cheryl, eagerly approaching. How long have you been in town? Why didn't you say anything? Jessica snapped back to reality, grabbed Cheryl's hand, and began to run towards her car. Cheryl was visibly confused, repeatedly asking the distraught Jessica what was wrong. 
Jessica didn't seem to hear a word she was saying. She just kept running. The two drove off in a heartbeat. Jessica appeared at the rearview mirror, but the shape was long gone. It had vanished the moment Cheryl appeared. They stopped by a nearby bar to compose themselves. So you want to tell me what you were doing at the edge of the bridge all by yourself? Asked Cheryl. Jessica was still trying to make sense of what happened on the bridge, desperately rationalizing what she witnessed. I, I just needed to clear my head, said Jessica, her voice trembling still. Cheryl grabbed her hand and looked her in the eye with a still and calming gaze. Honey, it's going to be all right. The two friends entered the bar to soothe their nerves. The two drank and laughed harder than they had ever for the past 20 years. They bonded for hours, telling past stories, reliving the spirit of their youth. Why didn't you just knock on my door, asked Cheryl. I'm not just going to show up unannounced and ask you if you want to hang out after 20 years, said Jessica. Why the hell not? You can always come to me, you know that, replied Cheryl. Jessica was dumbstruck at her friend's straightforward response. After all these years, Cheryl still has her back. A few hours passed and the two decided to part. Jessica insisted on driving Cheryl home. Just as she was about to turn and drive up Cheryl Street, Hey, where are you going? I don't live there anymore. Jessica was confused, yet obliged her friend. Driving up further down the road, up the other side of town, the two arrived at an intersection. It's been great seeing you again, Jess. Take care of yourself, you hear me? Jessica was reluctant to let Cheryl out of the car, but she figured she was a grown adult. Jessica asked her if she wanted a companion to help her get home, to which Cheryl politely declined. She hesitated to leave her friend behind. The area was devoid of light for miles. She worried about what lurked in the dark, so she decided to follow Cheryl home, only to realize she's nowhere to be found. Nothing but trees and darkness looming around her. She called Cheryl's name repeatedly. Jessica felt the cold breeze upon her again. Someone else was with her. She immediately got in the car and left, but she stared in the rearview mirror, hoping to get a glimpse of Cheryl. She didn't recall much from the night before, must have had one too many drinks. Jessica examined her bedroom once more before wishing it goodbye and heading to the airport. Just as she was about to get into her car, she stumbled into another friend from high school, Heather. She caught up with her old friend. Heather was shocked and stunned when she mentioned Cheryl. Oh my God, Jessica, Cheryl died 15 years ago. Jessica couldn't believe her ears. How could she? She asked Heather to refrain from making such a morbid joke. She insisted profusely that she met and talked with Cheryl. I, I'm so sorry, Jess. She's gone. The police said that she was last seen at the intersection and way past town. Two weeks later, she came up, strangled, left in a ditch meters from the intersection. We don't know who did it, but they saw someone in black around that area. Ever since then, we've avoided going out in the dark. <coughs> Kyle, Jared, and Dave are about to disembark on a supernatural expedition on the hallowed grounds of a cemetery on the outskirts of town. The three of them lost a bet, and they're compelled to spend a night in the cemetery. What could possibly go wrong? They parked their car at the edge of the gate, taking everything they had with them and journeying into the night. The place is completely devoid of life, with only the closest light source coming from the moon. Using a single flashlight and the minimal illumination of their phone, they found their way. The friends laughed, cheered, and made fun of their disposition to hide this senseless beating of their hearts and overwhelming fear that was creeping up on them. The three were so busy playing brave that they didn't notice which direction they were walking towards and which direction they'd come from. They were lost. The cemetery was massive, with endless rows of tombstones and mausoleums as far as they could see. Their flashlights offered very little help. The light could only reach so far. The merriment was quickly quashed and replaced with a deafening silence. The three of them went back and forth on who should go back and retrace their steps. Dave was handed the short end of the stick. He asked his friends to come with him, but they insisted that they needed to unpack their things. None of them wanted to be alone. Dave took with him the flashlight and went on his way. Kyle and Jared set up their tent in a clearing. Minutes passed by, but it felt like an eternity to Dave. He shined his light at the horizon, hoping to see the gates of the cemetery. The stillness of the night was shattered when he heard a rustling behind him. Dave ignored the commotion and continued onwards, convincing himself that it was just an animal. The rustling continued, and he saw something walk past him in the corner of his eye. Dave frantically searched for what just passed by him. He shined his flashlight at whatever moved until he saw something hiding behind a tree. It was Jared retreating behind the trees. He pled with Jared to come out and stop fooling around. The figure peered from behind the tree and stared directly at the fear-riddled youngster. Dave kept pleading Jared's name, asking him to stop and requesting to go home. Dave's flashlight began to fail. The light flickered and dimmed until Dave was covered in darkness. Merging from the shadows was Jared's silhouette, but something was wrong. His eyes were glowing. Illuminated by the moonlight, the figure approached Dave slowly. 
Dave kept pleading to Jared. The figure's shape began to contort as it approached, arms and legs elongating and bending into impossible positions. Bones cracking, flesh tearing, and animalistic snarling were drowned out by the cries of David, begging whatever was in front of him and calling out Jared's name. Dave's scream pierced Jared and Kyle's ears. Their stomachs churned and their legs turned to jelly. The two froze where they stood staring at each other and seeking the answer. Jared's voice shrank as he tried to call out Dave. His call was only met with silence. The same silence was replaced by slow rumbling sounds in the distance, followed by a loud roar from their car. The two raced towards the car, but by the time they'd arrived, someone resembling Dave had already taken it. Jared ran as fast as he could and begged Dave to stop and turn around. The car sped off and left Jared on the road. Jared turned to Kyle for his help, only to find him missing. Jared was alone. He called out Dave and Kyle's name, hoping that this was all some elaborate prank orchestrated by the two. The trees rustled behind him. Numerous humanoid figures emerged as he turned his head to the trees behind him. Their eyes glowed, bodies twisted and deformed into unholy shapes as their muscles and bones break down. Alone and helpless, Jared was left at the mercy of the night. Hello, I'm Gabriel. I'm 18 years old. Up until I was 12 years old, I lived in a small town in northeastern Brazil called Itaichinga. English is my second language, so please bear with me as I describe what happened to us. There was nothing much in our town. We had, of course, my school and the old square where there was a school of music and a bank and a gas station. But next to the school, there was an old castle. I never knew anything about it. There wasn't any reason why I would. One day at school, I heard two boys talking about the legend of Madame Araccio. The whole school believed in her, but I was skeptical. Like most boys, however, I was also curious to see if she was real. So one day after school, I called my friends Marcel, Mateus, and Sabrina. In the afternoon after classes were over, we went home and brought supplies with us. Flashlights, water, and food. We planned to spend the night there as well. So just in case of any emergency, we also carried a lighter, a knife, because, well, you know, you never know when you'll need a knife, and some money. I'm not really sure what we thought we'd need the money for, but we brought it anyway. We felt prepared to go exploring and see if this Madame was real. The castle's entrance had signs posted everywhere. No trespassing, private property, stuff like that. We found a back entrance that was oddly not locked at all. After exploring with our flashlights a bit, it was after dark by now, we found an area on the main floor big enough for us to settle in and spend the night. There was even an old fireplace in the room with dusty remains of charcoal and a partially burnt wood and ashes. I asked Sabrina to get some things for me to light the fire, but she was taking a while to come back. Marcel went exploring a bit, and I looked around at the other parts of the main floor. And then I heard something that made my heart stop. Multiple screams from inside the house. Sabrina and Matea suddenly appeared running towards us, themselves screaming too. Yet there was still this haunted wailing noise coming from the hallway. Sabrina and Mateus kept running out the back of the house the way we had come, calling for us to follow. As they ran past me, their faces seemed pale as snow in the reflected glow of my flashlight. I looked back up the corridor that they had come from, and I saw a pale creature in ladies' clothes, surrounded by a faint blue light like an aura. It was coming from within her, not from any lights in the castle or any of our own lights. At that moment, I froze, and when I blinked, she began running towards me. I ran like I never ran before in my life. Fortunately, Sabrina and Mateus had already left out the back of the castle, and Marcel quickly followed me. We left there, and we just kept running and running to make sure we were as far away as we could get. We all walked home in the silence created by our fear, looked around us vigilantly to make sure we were not being followed. We'll never know if that was Madame Horatio in the old castle, or if it was older kids playing a joke on us. We all vowed we'd never go back there, yet still to this day, I hear her screams. So to start off, I was smaller at the time and not too strong, but still, at least in my opinion, I think I was a good runner. At this point, I always went to my friends at 6.45 and came back around 8 to 9 to do my own thing, but during the fall and winter, it was way darker than in the summer. It was fall, so the roads were still clear to use my electric scooter to get home. It's faster than maybe a 10-minute walk with headphones. It was around maybe 8.45, somewhere between 8 and 9 when I started to roll my way home. I was maybe halfway there when I was on a path that goes behind houses and just to the side of a school and some trees. A lot of the walking path was completely pitch black, and the only thing that kept me from falling flat on my face was the knowledge of where the ditches were because I go on walks often. Just at the end of the path, before you find the light of the street again in front of the school, 
There is the darkest part with a massive ditch to the left, with it being hollow except for some trees and some bushes covering it on the rim, and a smaller ditch to the right, a.k.a. a perfect, invisible, and easy spot to hide from anyone without very strong light. I had just made it onto the street when I started hearing an echo of footsteps that make it sound like two pairs of feet. I rationalized it must be me slapping my foot hard on the concrete whenever I pushed. But I didn't push too often, and the footsteps didn't match sometimes. So I slowed down and waited a step, barely moving to listen. Stupid move. And I didn't hear a sound. A rush of relief hits me and I continue, but they start up again. During this time, I didn't dare look back. I sped up and a few seconds later, they did too. You might be thinking, how could they keep up if it was an electric scooter? But it was not very strong and all it really did was give me less work to do, but it was easy to catch up with if I wasn't using my life force to make it go faster. I was going decently fast, making sure not to look back or give any indication that I knew, and going a fairly normal but fast speed. I was so close to home and thinking for maybe a minute, this is ridiculous, you're just overreacting about an echo and you're acting like a nine-year-old. That's when I turned onto my street feeling a bit better, and the most ear-crushing tweet or whistle sound came from behind me to my right. I looked for a second to see something, but I didn't dare die looking, so I booked it off, not making a sound, rushing and almost destroying my shoes to make it home. I heard nothing except my own feet hitting the ground, and luckily the garage door was open and I rushed inside and closed the garage. The light's still on, looking out to see anybody. I never saw the person and was scared to death for the rest of the evening and the week. Whenever I went over there, I never took that route again, except for once after when someone accompanied me home. Some people say it was my imagination, but even if so, where the hell did that whistle behind me come from? (laughs) 